Hello, and welcome to a lecture on Microstrip Fundamentals. My name is Steve Ellingson. This lecture is about Microstrip Line and how we can use it for impedance matching. To begin, I'm showing you a diagram of what I mean by Microstrip. It consists of some metal trace on top of some dielectric slab, which itself is on top of a ground plane. Microstrip transmission line is commonly used to connect components on printed circuit boards, or what I'll refer to as PCBs. These same structures can be, and often are, used to implement single frequency, that is narrow band, impedance matching. And although we won't get to that point in this lecture, we'll set up all the relevant theory uh, and uh, parameter values that will allow us to do that in a future lecture. So what we'll cover in this lecture are, first, the limitations of discrete inductors and capacitors. Uh, that will really be the motivation for considering microstrip. And then we'll talk about the wonders of microstrip and, and how we can overcome those limitations. And primarily that allow us to do very, very high frequency uh, impedance matching structures. Basics on microstrip. Then some theory, input impedance of a terminated transmission line, a topic you've probably encountered in a previous course. Characteristic impedance and wavelength in microstrip, again, a theory that you have probably encountered previously, just a quick refresher here. And then open circuited and short circuited stubs. So once we know those things, we'll be ready to use microstrip as uh, an impedance matching tool. So first, limitations of discrete reactances, that is, uh, inductors and capacitors that we would ordinarily use on a printed circuit board. So previously, we have designed uh, lossless narrowband impedance matching networks using discrete inductors and capacitors, Ls and Cs. However, I pointed out that we find, in some cases, that the values of L that we need become too big, and the values of C that we require sometimes become too small to become practical. But that's not the only problem, certainly one class of problems, but not the only problem. At higher frequencies, and this can really be down to frequencies as low as those in the HF band, we have uh, some other difficulties. For example, here is a ideal capacitor, but we never actually see that. What we see is an ideal capacitance in series with some inductance, which is associated with things like the leads in the uh, capacitor or the traces that connect the capacitor to other devices. So we never actually get just capacitance. We always get a little bit of inductance as well. And similarly, we never get just an inductance. At higher frequencies and most of the RF band, we never really see just an inductance. What we see is an inductance in parallel with capacitance. And that's because each turn in this coil kind of looks a little bit like a parallel plate capacitor. So there's some capacitance between those turns, and that manifests uh, in a circuit sense as a parallel capacitance. And that's a resonant structure. In fact, we refer to the structure as having a self-resonant frequency, which means that there will be some frequency at which this behaves nothing like an inductor. Uh, and uh, that's a very big problem. Uh, typically, what's required when you have this effect and it's significant is you have to account for that capacitance, and then the circuit design becomes very, very complicated. As a result, discrete L's and C's become increasingly difficult to use above a few hundred megahertz. Now, to be honest, this effect can become significant at frequencies as low as tens of megahertz in the uh, HF band. In other cases, uh, you may be able to accommodate these kinds of problems at frequencies well into the gigahertz uh, SHF region. Suffice it to say, uh, once we get in the HF, VHF, UHF range, uh, we often find that this problem is sufficiently onerous that we would like to find some other way to do impedance matching. So, why microstrip? Well, the way out of the mess that I just showed you is to realize that we don't actually need inductance or capacitance. And in fact, these things are the source of the problem, right? Inductance is simply the tendency of a device 
to store energy in magnetic fields. And capacitance is simply the tendency of a device to store energy in electric fields. And the reason inductors and capacitors turn out to be useful for impedance matching is not because they have those characteristics, but because they give us certain relationships between voltage and current. All right. So realize that we use L's and C's in matching not because they have inductance or capacitance, but rather because they give us impedance transformation. That is, they change the complex value ratio of V to I, voltage to current. So what we should do is ask ourselves what else is available that allows us to change this ratio V to I and thereby affect impedance transformation. Well, the, the answer is obviously going to be microstrip lines. So once again, here's a microstrip line. It consists of a trace. Uh, that's just a terminology that we tend to use. It's typically metallic. It uh, can be described as a good conductor. It has some trace thickness T, which for our purposes is not going to become important. If we're really fussy or we have a really high performance design, we might need to know T. But for our purposes, as long as T is very, very tiny compared to all other dimensions, we can usually ignore it. Now that trace sits on a dielectric layer. That dielectric layer is characterized by a relative permittivity, a relative permittivity. And that's a number uh, that uh, ranges from one to some higher number uh, that represents the intrinsic capacitance of that uh, material. So uh, here I'm saying relative permittivity of the dielectric separating conductors, typically between two and six. By the way, for free space, this number is one. Um, and uh, typically for these applications, the number is somewhere between two and six, although certainly could be higher, certainly could be lower. The thickness of the substrate is H. That's the separation between the trace and the ground plane. And it's assumed this ground plane is much wider than the uh, trace itself. Uh, this is typically covering the whole printed circuit board. And then we describe the width of the trace using the variable W. So the three things that kind of enter into the description of a microstrip transmission line are the relative permittivity of the dielectric layer, the height, that is the thickness of the uh, dielectric layer, and the width of the trace. Those three things determine the relevant parameters of the transmission line. Now let's go back to some general theory uh, so we can see how we're going to use this uh, microstrip line. Here I'd like to address the input impedance of a transmission line. So this is a topic that you have undoubtedly already encountered. The question is this, if I have some terminating impedance Z sub L, L could mean load or it could be something else, but the idea is it's the terminating impedance. And then I have a length L of transmission line the question is, what is the input impedance, Z sub in? Now remember, impedance is the ratio of voltage to current. So the question I'm really asking here is, what is the ratio of voltage to current at this point, at the input of the transmission line, when the transmission line has length L and is terminated into an impedance Z sub L? And you should know from a previous course that the answer to that question is given by this rather intimidating looking equation, but it's not so bad. Uh, the idea is that it depends on the length, of course, but also two other things. It depends on wavelength, and that's wavelength in the transmission line, and this thing, which is characteristic impedance. This parameter gamma here is the reflection coefficient, the voltage reflection coefficient, and that's evaluated here. So gamma is evaluated here. It's a voltage reflection coefficient going from the transmission line give, described by characteristic impedance Z sub C and uh, the load impedance Z sub L and this is the usual formula and that should also be something that you recognize. So to compute the ratio of voltage to current at this point I need to know the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and I need to know the wavelength in the transmission line then the length and then I can compute uh, this parameter. So 
for any type of transmission line, those are the two properties that I need to be able to determine in order to use this expression. The characteristic impedance, Z sub C, and the wavelength, lambda, and that's the wavelength in the transmission line, which is not necessarily the wavelength in free space. So let's see how this plays out for microstrip transmission line. Once again, I'm showing the uh, parameters that pertain to microstrip line design. We can compute a phase velocity. V sub P is phase velocity. That's the speed at which a monochromatic a single frequency signal travels through a transmission line. And that's given by C, which is the free speed of light in free space, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the effective relative permittivity after you take the square root. So what is this effective relative permittivity? It is not the same as the relative permittivity of the dielectric. Rather, it can be approximated, at least, by this expression. See, the issue here is that if this wave, which is carrying the signal in the transmission line, were completely embedded in this uh, relative permittivity, then that value there would be e, uh, epsilon sub r. But what happens is we have these fringing fields. We have electromagnetic energy, which is outside the transmission line, not all of it is inside the transmission line. So this parameter is not exactly epsilon sub r. We have this modified value. And if you look at this for a moment, what this really is, is simply the average of epsilon sub r and the value for free space, which is 1. So this is a very crude estimate, but it works surprisingly well. Now, if you're interested in being really precise with this number, there are much better and much more accurate expressions which take into account the dimensions of the transmission line. Uh, for most practical work, that's really not necessary. It's never wrong to use it. But for simplicity here, this will get us uh, most of the way to where we want to go. And we'll find that there are other things that kind of get in the way of an accurate answer and which make more accurate values here not so useful. In any event, once we have the phase velocity, we can determine the wavelength in the dielectric as the ratio of the phase velocity divided by frequency. Phase velocity is speed of light divided by the square root of the effective permittivity. And C divided by F, of course, is the wavelength in free space. So one way to compute the wavelength in the dielectric is to compute the wavelength in free space. That's C over F and divide by the square root of the effective relative permittivity. The other thing we need to know is the characteristic impedance. Now, in general, this is pretty complicated. Uh, and I'll show you uh, some ways to get numbers for this. But what we're looking for is the characteristic impedance. And I'll tell you that this depends on two things. And you probably already have encountered this in a previous course, but just to kind of remind you. It will depend on the inverse square root of the effective relative permittivity. Shouldn't be surprising because phase velocity also depends on that. And then also on the ratio of H to W. That is the ratio of the slab thickness to the width of the transmission line. So generally, if you know the effective relative permittivity, and if you know the ratio of H to W, you can calculate the uh, characteristic impedance. So here's one way to do this. I'm going to compute it for a particular relative permittivity, epsilon r equals 4.5. As we'll see in a moment, this corresponds to the very popular circuit board material known as FR4. But if I compute this for some other relative permittivity, I would get very similar looking results. The numbers would be different, but the trends would be the same. In this plot, I have on the x-axis h over w, the ratio of the height to width. On the vertical axis, I have the resulting characteristic impedance. Now here I use Z sub naught. Uh, that's kind of a no-no. This should really be Z sub C. I don't want to confuse this with the uh, reference impedance for S parameters. So you should not uh, think of that as being Z sub naught. Uh, 
although frequently people refer to characteristic impedance as z sub naught. So this is one of those cases where you just have to make sure you understand what each of the parameters mean. Uh, in the context of what we're talking about here, this is z sub c. In any event, this vertical axis is the characteristic impedance. Now, you may have encountered in previous classes various approximations for microstrip transmission line impedance. Uh, there are two very common ones. I'm not going to derive them here. I'll just show you what they look like. This blue curve is a model which assumes that the transmission line is very, very wide relative to the thickness. And these green curves correspond to a model in which the transmission line is very narrow relative to the uh, thickness of the substrate. Now, neither one of those is quite right, although in regimes where those approximations hold, the results tend to be pretty good. A far more accurate and generally applicable result is given definitively in this paper, which you see is from 1977, but I strongly recommend this paper. Uh, equation 10 in this paper, which I think is repeated in the textbook also, yes it is, here it is, equation 926 in the book, takes into account all the parameters, so there's relatively few approximations in it, and it gives you this red curve. So the red curve shown here is the curve I would recommend using. It's relatively simple to compute using this equation. Or if you know you're using a material with relative permittivity 4.5, you could just use this chart and just read the values off. Let's talk about FR4 since we've already brought this up. FR4 circuit board material looks like this. Uh, it's uh, typically yellowish in color. It's actually a fiberglass epoxy, so it has kind of a fiberglass kind of texture to it. Uh, its usual appearance is something like this. Usually it's uh, coated in a green or red. That's to keep uh, solder from bridging between pins or components on the printed circuit board. Uh, so its usual appearance is more like this. It's typically green or red, uh, and of course all the components are, are uh, lay on top of it. Here are the relevant parameters. The dielectric is fiberglass epoxy. Its relative permittivity is 4.5, plus or minus 10%. And this is important to know because since both the wavelength and the characteristic impedance depend on this parameter, you now see that it's going to be hard to know either one of those things uh, to better than that. Uh, also, we know the wavelength is about 0.6 times the wavelength in free space. Uh, the wavelength is shorter than the wavelength in free space. And remember, we get this from the expression lambda naught over the square root of the effective relative permittivity, as I showed you on a previous slide. The standard thickness, and I put that in quotes, this is a industry standard uh, thickness. It comes in other thicknesses, but this is the one that's normally used, is um, 1.575 millimeters also known as 0.062 inches. And of course other thicknesses are possible, especially if you use multi-layer board. So let's return to this plot. Remember the red curve is the, the accurate one, the one that's generally applicable for all values of H over W. For FR4, we have a nominal value of relative permittivity 4.5. Uh, an important piece of trivia here is that if you want a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, 50 ohms being a very commonly sought after number in radio engineering, then you find that that corresponds to an H over W right here. That's a value of one half. So a very useful piece of trivia to know about FR4 is that if you need a characteristic impedance of about 50 ohms, the ratio of height to width should be about one half. And since we know the standard thickness of FR4, that implies a trace width of three millimeters. So if you have standard FR4 with the standard thickness, you know a trace width of three millimeters will give you a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. So there you have it. Now let me address this issue of manufacturing variance. As I pointed out, the relative permittivity of FR4 can range easily by as much as plus or minus 10 percent. So what I'm plotting here is characteristic impedance in ohms as a function of the trace width, that's W. And what we see is for the nominal thickness, that's the solid line, we get for a trace width of three millimeters, a characteristic of 50 
characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, as uh, I pointed out in the previous slide. And then the dashed lines are what we get if the relative permittivity is 10% higher or lower. So what we see is that within the standard manufacturing variants of this material, the resulting characteristic impedance could vary by as much as 3 or 4 ohms. So for this reason, it's usually not productive to be too fussy about exact computation of the uh, characteristic impedance. In other words, plugging this into some uh, very complicated equation uh, or working through some electromagnetic simulation to work it out frequently is not very useful. And the reason being that these variations that you expect to see in the material itself are typically larger than the errors that you would be correcting for by using those more advanced techniques. So there are certainly other materials available for printed circuit boards besides FR4. FR4 is very common because it is the same low cost material that's used for nearly all non-RF applications. But FR4 has drawbacks, has large variations in dielectric constant, as I just showed you, possibly significant variations with frequency and temperature. In fact, this drives RF designers nuts in some cases because equipment gets hot when it's turned on and just the temperature can be enough to change the electromagnetic properties of the transmission lines. So if you're sensitive to this, and many applications we are, then FR4 can be a turnoff. Also, the loss in FR4 can be possibly significant. It is not an ideal lossless dielectric. There is a little bit of loss, that is some fraction of the signal in the transmission line is dissipated in the dielectric. And that loss typically is not a problem below a few hundred megahertz, but once you get up in the SHF range, for example, that loss becomes quite significant and uh, may become large enough that you are no longer able to accommodate uh, those losses. Other materials are quite often used for RF applications for these reasons, especially at higher frequencies. Uh, once you're in the UHF, uh, SHF bands uh, for sure, uh, and in high performance applications where you need very low loss or very precise characteristic impedance. So these other materials typically have dielectric constant in the range 2 to 6. Uh, there are applications for all numbers in that range. Uh, they typically have tighter tolerances on dielectric constant and typically lower variation with temperature. Now there's no significant difference to us uh, in terms of how we design using those materials. I just want you to know that those materials are out there. Okay, so now back to theory once again. We're going to want to know two things in order to do impedance matching with microstrip transmission lines, which are results that we already have available from transmission line theory in general. One thing we're going to want to know is the input impedance of an open circuited stub. Open circuited stub is simply a length of transmission line, length L, having a characteristic impedance Z sub C, terminated into a load impedance which is infinite, in other words an open circuit. And we can calculate that input impedance Z sub N using the equation we've already presented. The value of gamma is simply infinity minus Z sub C, infinity plus Z sub C, which gives you plus one. Again, you've hopefully seen this in a previous course. We make that substitution into the equation and we get this. I can multiply top and bottom by e to the minus j 2 pi l over lambda and I get this expression. This becomes a trigonometric expression through a identity which I'm sure you've seen many times. This becomes another trigonometric expression by virtue of an identity which again I think you've seen many times. And the ratio of those two trig uh, functions is cotangent. So what we find is that the input impedance for an open circuited stub is minus J times characteristic impedance times this cotangent function, which depends on L over lambda, the electrical length of the transmission line. Now just a note here, this looks, at least from an impedance perspective, at the ports like a capacitor, that is when the length is less than lambda by 4. If L is less than lambda by 4, this is positive, and we see that we have a pure reactance 
which has a negative sign. And that is also what we get would get from a capacitor. So at any one frequency, you can come up with an open circuited transmission line, an open circuited stub, which has the same impedance as a capacitor. So now we see how we can go about replacing capacitors with transmission lines. We can do a similar trick with short circuited stubs. So same problem, except the termination is zero, it's short circuit. For a short circuit, the value of gamma, zero minus the characteristic impedance, zero plus the characteristic impedance, we get a value of minus one. We substitute that back into the expression. We again multiply through by e to the minus j two pi L over lambda to get these expressions in the numerator and denominator. Again, we apply trig identities to get trig functions. The ratio of those trig functions is tangent. And so we find that the input impedance of a short circuited stub is plus j times characteristic impedance times tangent 2 pi L over lambda. And guess what? When the length is less than lambda by 4, tangent is positive, which means that we have a pure positive reactance that looks like an inductor. So for any one frequency, not for all frequencies, but for any one frequency, we can find a short circuited stub which has the same reactance, the same impedance, in fact, as an inductor. So we see that short circuited stubs can be used to replace inductors. Now one more thing I want to show you before we get into the business of impedance matching, which will be a future lecture, is admittance. Now hopefully you know that admittance is the reciprocal of impedance. So for example, here we see an open circuited stub. We just worked out that its input impedance is minus j times characteristic impedance times cotangent 2 pi L over lambda. The admittance of that stub is just 1 over z stub. So minus j becomes plus j, zc becomes y sub c, where y sub c is a reciprocal of z sub c, and cotangent becomes tangent. We just take the reciprocal. So here we have it, the admittance of an open circuited stub, a useful expression to know. We can do the same thing for a short circuited stub. Here is the expression we worked out just uh, just a few minutes ago for z stub uh, when the uh, termination is short circuited. We take the reciprocal to get y stub and we find minus j y sub c cotangent 2 pi l over lambda. So these expressions will become useful when we start doing single stub matching. So the path forward. Using what we've developed in this lecture, we're now in a position to do single stub impedance matching. Uh, once again, this is probably a topic you've encountered in a previous course, but here we're doing it for a particular reason. We need to develop these impedance matching structures that work at higher frequencies. We'll also talk about quarter wave impedance matching structures. You may or may not have encountered these before, but it's an alternative way to do impedance matching, useful in some cases, and we'll talk about that also can be done using microstrip transmission lines. And then looking further down the road, we can use the same concepts to implement filters. Now a filter is a device which modifies frequency response, but usually keeping the impedance uh, the same. But we'll see how we can develop these structures, structures based on microstrip transmission line, into filters. And that'll be a very useful thing, again, at high frequencies where discrete L's and C's might let us down. This concludes this lecture on microstrip fundamentals.